Welcome back to Conceptualism. I'm very grateful to have today with me a good friend uh, and uh, an incredible intellectual artist, composer, Alexander Fry. Uh, thanks for joining us, Alex. And uh, this has been a long time in the making and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation this evening. Lovely, lovely to see you, but composer, even though it's one of my favorite activities, it's one of the ones that unfortunately I do the least at the moment because of my other activities, which are as conductor and pianist and organist and a lot of performances which you have you which have joyfully, but also uh, in some way have usurped my composing time, but I hope to achieve a better balance this year. Yes, well, I mean, I think uh, you think like a composer and you think like a composer because as a conductor, you have to translate the composer's intention to the orchestra. That's, well, thank you. That's, I take that as a high compliment. And, but, and curiously enough, I think some of the greatest uh, conductors have been composers. Yes. Not just, not hobby composers, but real composers. For example, Gustav Mahler, of course, mm. one of the greatest. Mm. Richard Strauss, even though if you look at videos of his conducting, you might not think he's much of a conductor at all. But in fact, those videos of him conducting performances of his own, of performances of his own music mm. illustrate something that you don't see. Even though he looks thoroughly bored, which is even more ironic because it's his own music that he's conducting. I mean, he mm. just is going like this, you know, if you look at the watch, he's got something better to do. <laughs> and he looks just completely, completely bored. But what it doesn't show is the fact that in rehearsals, he was extremely passionate and extraordinarily detailed. Mm. Uh, we have written records of this from musicians who had worked under him. Hmm. And so when he got to the performance, he had done all this incredible detailed work. And so he simply indicated, you know, a tempo and a kind of a conducting which kept everybody together, but he relied upon the musicians to um, fulfill his wishes hmm. Uh, hmm. based on how he had rehearsed. And indeed they did. And if you just shut your eyes and listen to those performances of Strauss conducting and not watch him conduct, uh, they're very exciting. And it's because he was exciting in the rehearsals. But when he got to the performances, he thought, I'm just going to keep everybody together, but they know what to do. Right, right. So there was a kind, of, that, sto there was a kind of stoicism. Well, it showed that he, he understood his music, in this case, his own music, of course, from the inside mm. out. Mm. Uh, but Mahler, of course, conducted other people's music and, and he was one of the greatest conductors in history. And his ability to get inside a composer's head and know what those intentions were on the page and translate that to the orchestra came from his own understanding of composing from the inside out, being mm. one of the greatest composers himself. Leonard Bernstein is a modern example of exactly the same. He had mm. a very deep understanding of the composer's intentions because he himself was a composer. He, he knew the suffering that went into creating those little black dots on the page mm, mm. and giving them the energy, each note that becomes sound mm. and, and auto automatically claims the listener through a great performance. And he did that because he had a composer's understanding of the music. Dimitri yes. Metropolis is the same way. Yes, and, and, and I think uh, a great thinker, uh, you know, uh, becomes a great thinker because they have studied other great thinkers and much the same for uh, composers, conductors, and musicians. And if you don't... We're, we're the products of tradition. Indeed, indeed. Even the people that claim to break with tradition or to be radicals or enfants terribles, uh, you know, I mean, it's ironic because there's an entire tradition of that. Completely. Well, it's not, it's not a tradition of being an enfant terrible. It's the fact that they're all rooted in traditions, but they make, uh, they do something very unusual and off the beaten track to get attention. Mm. Uh, but if you look at what they all do, it's completely traceable to some tradition that mm. preceded them mm. or other, in case of performances, performers, mm. uh, 
tracing to the traditions of other performers before them, or mm -hmm. even from uh, different disciplines. Yes, yes, because there are interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary artists. Um, and, and I think someone, uh, someone that really knows the tradition, that's erudite, that has uh, a deep uh, scholarly understanding of what it is they're performing, and a contextual understanding that comes from historic awareness and, and things like that, they, they will give a much deeper performance than somebody that just reads the notes and, and then you know, goes on stage and beats their hands around. Yes, but even, even that, I, I don't think it's always necessarily to, necessary to give a performance that's in a historical context. No, uh, but to be I, aware I, of the I, history. Because there's, well, no, yes. yeah, there's, no real, there's no such thing as historic performance, because really there's no way of knowing how things sounded. We can guess at it. There's educated guesses, hypotheses, uh, but there, there's no real way of, of you know, playing Bach the way Bach wanted Bach played. That's impossible. Um, but what well, I mean, we do have, Well, we do have people who wrote things very specifically about how things were done Bach, during Bach's time, part, and particularly the writings of Bach's own son, Carl Philip Emanuel. Mm. Bach. Mm. Uh, he wrote CPE. a very, a very uh, astute and um, rather clear thesis of mm. performance practice back in his father's day. Mm. But um, we have an idea. But you know, in a way, everything that we do musically is pure guesswork. You know, if you say, how did the composer perform? We can't really say we know unless we have recordings of them, but you know, mm. they lived during the era of, re of recording. Mm. We know how Marcel Dupre performed because mm. we have recordings of his playing. Mm. We have recordings of him playing his own music. Mm. That's the advantage of growing up in the modern age, of course. Yes. But for example, like if you do a Beethoven symphony, I mean, I, just a few weeks ago, I conducted the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. Mm. And, uh, there are times where he writes poco a poco crescendo from pianissimo to fortissimo, hmm. but it's over 16 measures, over hmm. 18 measures. I mean, and how do you gauge such a long crescendo? We don't know how Beethoven did it in his own time. We hmm. don't know exactly what he meant do we bring in the most important and most uh, prominent part of the crescendo, three measures before the end, before we get to the fortissimo, mm. two measures, five measures, eight measures? At what point are we in the crescendo when we're halfway through there? Mm. You see, this pure guesswork, and it means that it's what we call interpretation. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and it's interesting because some uh, visual practices, whether it's sculpture or painting or even writing, uh, you know, there's much more that can be understood or gleaned because you have the text, the, the living text in front of you. You can judge the Mona Lisa because the painting's right there in front of you, you know, um, and uh, a piece of music, um, a score is merely a blueprint. It's like if you saw a sketch of the Mona Lisa and then had to judge the actual Mona Lisa based on that sketch. Um, so it's very interesting. Exactly. I think exactly. That's a very, that's a very good analogy. Mm. Mm. It's like the Mahler 10th Symphony. It existed in the form of a sketch. Mm. We don't even know if Mahler finished it. I mean, mm. he may have written all of these notes, but we don't know if he put in all of his markings. Mm. Uh, there have been people who come out with editions based on the sketches. Right. He completed the first movement of that. Mm. But mm. we don't we don't know what he would have done had he had more time. Yes. What he would have added. Maybe he would have crossed out some things and made some corrections. Maybe he would have added more dynamics, mm. more accents, more anything, mm. you know, but all we have is a sketch, yeah. which is the reason why Leonard Bernstein never regarded it as part of the canon of symphonies of Mahler. Mm. And I actually agree with Bernstein. Uh, I don't think Mahler had the time to refine the work. Okay, yeah. I don't, I, I don't find it as good a piece as the nine symphonies that came before it. Now that's a strictly, strictly subjective viewpoint. Mm. Um, 
and others might disagree with me. I know people who think it's a masterwork. I don't particularly think it's a masterwork. And I think Mahler knew that he had already said everything he had to say in the previous nine symphonies and Das Lied von der Erde, hmm. which is a symphony in itself in a sense, but with voices um, and uh, or voice. And, hmm. but I don't think, um, I don't, I, I, I've always had a hard time with the Mahler 10th because I felt that it was an unfinished work. Well, you know, I, I, I think I think Mahler knew that it it didn't match up to what he had written before that. It's just again, this is all subjective, but it never claimed me. I felt when he got to the end of the Ninth Symphony, that was his farewell to the world, and mm -hmm. he had said everything he wanted to say in that, in the Ninth, and the previous eight symphonies that preceded it. You know. Yes, well, there's- We don't, those... like, again, we don't know. And this is a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. It's all guesswork in a sense. Yes. Well, I spoke to, a, I spoke to a, an artist colleague of mine who I respect deeply. And they said, you know, there's no such thing as an artwork that's finished. Everything is an abandoned project. You know, nothing is really done. And if, if you <laughs> claim that it's done, then it's really not uh, an interesting perspective. Nobody really finishes anything. You know, if you say it's finished, it's, you know, it's not really My, I, I, have, I have an uncle who's a wonderful painter. Mm -hmm. And he said the hardest thing about, that he found about painting was when to know it's done. Yes. When to know a painting is completed. Yes. And I, I've asked this question to other painter friends mm -hmm. of mine, mm -hmm. and they said, that's absolutely true. <laughs> How do you know when it's enough? Yeah. There's no more to add. Mm. It's this, I think it's the same thing with, um, with every creative artist who, who makes something that's substantial in terms of Certainly. painting. Certainly. Like one of these that are behind me here. And how did Martina Wernicke, who painted this wonderful painting behind me, how did she know when it was done? Right. And and many great polymaths have have abandoned their projects halfway. And and uh, how does how does how does a novelist know when his book is done? Sure. How does a composer know when to put in the final cadenza or two flourish. lines? Yeah, the yeah. Final bar. Say, yeah. Fini, fine. This yeah. is it. Finito. It's over. Yeah. Piece is done. It's yeah. a hard thing to do. However, whereas they have completed a work, a composition or mm. painting or book. For the performer, the work is never done. Indeed, indeed. Always something more to say. It carries a life. It carries a life of its own. You see this in the Harry Potter franchise. People years down the line are going to still be discussing uh, whether Snape really wanted to do X, Y, and Z thing to you know Harry Potter. That 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 fiction, even though it's it's well, it it's closed. It's finished. Um, it, it has a massive life uh, online, both as, as uh, fan fiction, as well as people discussing the literary work itself, as well as the films, the music. Well, it's, become, you, you, it's become a whole world, essentially. Well, you, but you can say that. About, I mean, you can say what would have happened in Shakespeare? What would have happened if, sure. if the friar had not delivered the message to, or if the friar had delivered the message mm. saying that, Juliet's taken a potion. Yeah, she will wake up. Just wait for her. But instead, Romeo arrives and sees what he thinks is her dead body, and he's absolutely crushed by it. And he kills himself. And then she wakes up, and she sees him, and then she kills herself because she's so yes. heartbroken. Yes. So what happens if the friar's message got to Romeo, and he knew it, and he just waited for wake up, said, "I'm up. here. We here. I am Juliet. Let's get out of here." You know. And there are creative writers who have done that. You know, there are well, who have taken that who have taken that challenge or taken that uh, that storyline. The divergence of a storyline is, is something that many writers, uh, even in academia, I think uh, in high school, you know, um, I remember we had an English teacher who asked us to write up alternative endings for, for famous, uh, you know, stories. Um, well, that's all that's all great, but it doesn't change the story. The story. No, the, no, the, the story. Part. That's the integrity the story, of the story. Yeah. 
yeah, the story is the story. If somebody wants to write a sequel, mm. whether it's to Romeo and Juliet or Harry Potter, mm. that's up to them. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change the original story. This is this is the mm. thing about. Um, I mean, you can adapt a story, you can reinterpret it. I mean, I'll give you an example. A long West Side Story, mm. uh, along, along Romeo and Juliet lines. I just saw the Steven Spielberg uh, film of West Side Story. Okay. Now, this is, a, this is a musical which I know intimately. In fact, I'm in my second run of it, in a sense, because I conducted it in Prague over a span of four seasons. And uh, I'm in my third year now as music director of the production of West Side Story at the Opera House in Varna, Bulgaria. And I went to see the Spielberg film with great anticipation and mm. I thought it was magnificent. Mm. But what was interesting to me is the changes he had made. Mm. First of all, uh, he had readapted the dialogue. He made it really up to date because the original dialogue was created by Arthur Lawrence who wrote the book for the show in the 1950s. And Arthur had created his kind of own vernacular. Mm. Uh, for example, cut the Frabba Jabba. Well, you know, I think Arthur Lawrence was a genius and I've read other things he's, writ he's written like Home of the Brave, which is a great play that he wrote. Uh, but I just can't, in modern times, you know, what we know about gangs, about what we read on in the newspapers and what we see on television and movies of, you know, really tough, murderous, violent, brutal gang life. Uh, and what we see in, in movies of our time, for example, or in television series, the vernacular they use is quite different. Mm. And, um, and I think Steven Spielberg sort of updated that aspect of West Side Story. Mm. And uh, I, I love Arthur Lawrence's, Arthur Lawrence um, dialogue, and especially because of the era from which it came. But I love Spielberg's as well. Now, is it the same story? Yes. Is it rooted in Romeo and Juliet? Yes. But there are changes that I thought were very effective. Um, for, and what, I mean, I actually cried at least three times during it. The first time I cried had to do with the staging. It was during the song Maria. And at the end where he sings the most beautiful sound I ever, well, first of all, he's singing it uh, surrounded on three sides by this apartment building and uh, he's in the courtyard and you see while he's singing Maria I just met a girl named Maria and suddenly that name will never sound be the same to me um, they show women hanging their laundry on the balconies uh, you know waving at each other talking to each other you see I think uh, somebody cooking a meal on the inside or cleaning the, the apartment and only at the very end, the most beautiful sound I ever heard, Maria. And all of a sudden, there she is on the balcony behind him. I think he has his back to, to, to it. And all of a sudden, there she is. It's like the sunlight appears on her and lights her up. And you know, this made me choke up. I was so moved by the staging of this. Um, hmm. And another, another section, uh, one of the other times is when uh, Maria has, has heard that, um, that Tony killed Bernardo, her brother. And in the show, uh, he appears in her room and she's, she looks at him and she runs up and she starts banging on his chest and she says, kill her, kill her, kill her. And this music starts. And he sings, I will, I will take you away for, 
um, I will take you away, take you far, far away out of here, far, far away till the walls and the streets disappear. Um, and then they both sing together somewhere. There must be a place we can be, we can be free. I'm a terrible singer, but, but that's how it goes. And instead, he comes into her room from the fire escape and she starts saying, killer, killer, killer. And he comes out, comes in from the window and he falls on his knees. And he puts his arms around her, he puts his head against her stomach and the music from uh, the song somewhere. And she, uh, gosh, I'm tearing up now just thinking about it. And she puts her arms around him and it's such, a moment of sadness and you know like what do we do now i love you though regardless of all that mm. and then the the ending just killed me because in in the musical tony's been shot and maria takes him into her arms as he's dying and and they have a they have this dialogue and then she sings to him, hold my hand and we're halfway there. And then he joins in with her, hold my hand and I'll take you there. I mean, he sings with barely whispering because he's dying. And then they, then they, they, she sings somehow, and he kind of trails off the world, he goes somehow, and he dies in her arms. And it's well, this the last. Was... Well, let me, let me finish. Let me finish, please. It's the last love duet, and it's so heartbreaking when you see it on stage. That's the way it's done on stage. That's the, the the way it's written in the show. That's not the way Steven Spielberg did it, though. Um, she takes him into her arms, and she sings the beginning of the music from the balcony scene, from, which is called Tonight. And it's, oh, you're the, gosh, it just kills me. I cried, I'm crying now just thinking about it. It just killed me. And she sings, only you, you're the only thing I'll see forever. Oh. But he doesn't sing with her as he does in the stage production when they sing uh, somewhere, he's he's basically de already dead. Mm. And then, and when I heard this, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, what's going to happen next? Because in the show, the orchestra goes, -da -da. after she sings this, after he's died in her arms. But instead, they began just the strings. Do -do 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 actually very slowly yeah it was just with the harmony underneath it and it was heartbreaking just heartbreaking i i wept i even feel like weeping now it was just it was so beautiful but you see this is an example this was First of all, it was, it was a slight retelling of the story, switching a few musical things around, and the staging of it. Uh, and then he, the character of Doc, which is the friar in Romeo and Juliet, the, 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 because West Side Story is based on Romeo and Juliet, but Doc is actually played by a woman in Spielberg's film. Interesting enough, played by Rita Moreno, who was the original Anita in the 1960 film and in the original production in 1957. And he created a whole different character for her, similar to Doc, but a whole different dialogue. And you know, this was a retelling of a famous musical, retold by, and this has to do with the interpreter, retold by a master storyteller. Steven Spielberg. And obviously the changes were with the approval of the Bernstein estate. Um, and, uh, and with a completely different dialogue, except, 
except for Maria's closing speech when she lifts up the gun, which is how many bullets are left in this. That was the original dialogue of Arthur Weiss. And then there was another few lines uh, which were original. And of course, the when Juliet appears, I'm oh, sorry, when <laughs> Maria appears on the balcony at the end of the song, Maria, and the sunlight seems to light her up. And that's clearly, at least it was to me, and this is my own interpretation, a reference to the balcony, balcony scene of Romeo and Juliet, when he looks, when he sees her, and, and he says, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. And of course the sun is on her at that moment. I just, I, I just wept during those, particularly during those three moments uh, in Spielberg's uh, telling of West Side Story. But you see, this is, and sorry, you had to suffer through my singing. I'm a terrible singer. It's one thing I cannot do, but uh, this illustrates our whole point is that a great work of art is open to interpretation. You mentioned the Mona Lisa. Now we see the Mona Lisa or, or any other great work of Da Vinci. And you might see it as, as one thing, but the person standing next to you looking at it at the exact same time in real time see, says, I, I don't see that. I see something completely differently. Yes, well, the and subjectivity of human perception is, is quite evident to anyone who studies. But that's the point of art. Yes. All art is subjective. Yes. I mean, even, but even there are composed... but there but there are objective standards that can be uh, fleshed out from, uh, let's say, best practice that comes through Those... when when you have a, when you have a tradition um, in classical music, for example, um, you know, we, we know what what is possible on the piano and we cannot unsee that. It's like the cat's out the bag. So now when we judge any pianist, we judge them based on everything that has come before. So in that sense, it's also uh, cumulative and it's also uh, in that sense, uh, a time-based uh, you know, perspective where if it's I was in the 60s- It's still Oh, sure, subjective. sure. I mean, some, someone might appreciate uh, you know, the repetition of an arpeggio for 10 hours, uh, whereas someone else might want two minutes of octaves. It really depends uh, on, on the individual listener. So in, in that sense, the artist, the musician is accountable to their audience uh, and but whether even, someone's even, willing to pay to see that yeah, performance. Even, even the person who created a work of art, whether it be composer or writer, hmm. often looks back at, let's say comp there are composers who look back at a piece and said, oh, well, you know, I, I want to redo that. Bernstein hmm. revised certain things that he had written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah. Candide went under some revision. Well, and, and some, some artists even completely distance themselves from works that they've done in the past. They, they will completely, well. they will, they will completely uh, you know, distance themselves and-, and, and um, but, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but it's completely, it's completely normal because people change over time. They yes. grow, they evolve. And so something that a composer yes. might've written 30 years earlier or yeah. that a, a writer might have written 30 years earlier. So, oh, you know, I could have done that better. Mm -hmm. West Side Story, for example, Stephen Sondheim has said in interviews that there were, there were a few lyrics that he would have written differently mm -hmm. uh, uh, because he felt looking back that Maria, you know, at her age, being a teenager, would not have said, I feel pretty, oh, so pretty that the city should give me its key. He said, mm -hmm. He looked back later and he said a lyric like that, for example, is far too sophisticated for the character. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's a great lyric. You know, it's a lyric that we are still quoting to this day because mm -hmm. it is sophisticated, but it's a, the song is charming and she's charming. And it's alarming how charming she feels. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, if you wanted to be realistic, you would say that this... 16 or 17 year old girl probably wouldn't say that or mm -hmm. sing it, but that's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is the song called for it in a way, and it's, it's such a wonderful and charming song, and it is a work of art. And when it was created, it still stands as part oh, so, of the big so, piece we quote to this day. And it's perfect, therefore, in that sense. Perfect for us. We're the subjective interpreters mm -hmm. because we're we're listening into experiencing it. Now the author might feel differently, but that's because it's his own creation. Mm. And if he wants to change it, he has the right to change it. For us to change the lyrics uh, would be 
you know, would be more problematic. It was Spielberg changed the dialogue, but the, but the import of it is still the same. And he changed a few of the musical numbers and switched around, but he did it beautifully in a master in a masterful way. And so that West Side Story is really still West Side Story. Mm. I I did it even though I was aware of stylistic changes, to me, it was still the story. And I came out thinking I saw West Side Story. And I, I didn't know Stephen Sondheim. I didn't know Arthur Lawrence. I didn't know Jerome Robbins, but I did know Leonard Bernstein. And I think he would have approved of all of the changes. I think he would have been really overjoyed to see the, to have seen this version if he was alive today. I think he did see it. He had the best seat in the house. <laughs> Well, and that's interesting because when you when you retain the fidelity to a work of art or a story, um, then there is room for tasteful uh, reinterpretation. I was also going to say that art, you know, I, art, especially great art, uh, in a sense, suspends reality, and and it's a it's a kind of playground for, um, for the human imagination to to take flight, um, and whatever medium you happen to choose, whether it's mathematics or or music. I think the human mind is capable of great, great things uh, when it's allowed the space to 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 be free and to to play in in this immense and and ineffable playground, which is the entire which is the entire artistic canon that we've seen to date. And what I see as very interesting as well is that a lot of great artists have have taken their time and immemorialized it so that the common theme, the humanistic or, or human theme can be understood regardless of when the story is, is retold. Uh, Romeo and Juliet will always be a, a great love story. And as, yeah. Rumi, as Rumi and Hafiz might say, uh, everything is a love story if you, if you see it the right way. Ah, yeah, yes. Well, Rumi is certainly, let's just say that his observations were extremely astute. Yes, well, he, he and, was at and the seat. Timeless, and timeless. Exactly, exactly. And that's how you judge whether something is great art. It's, it's timeless. Right. It must transcend its context. Uh, and Rumi for was me, at the, yeah. well, For me, that's the definition of a masterpiece. Brahms I'm, first I'm very glad that you said that because well, that, but, that was but, an area of contention when we first spoke on Alexandra well, Blackfeld's organ yeah, job. But, but, yeah, but see, but that's, but for me, uh, you know, I, for example, Brahms, First Symphony, hmm. that will all, or the Beethoven Fifth, or Ninth, or what any of these great, I, I call them masterpieces of humanity hmm. because they have been, they are as prominent and as influential as the uh, Colosseum in Rome mm -hmm. or St. Peter's Basilica. Hmm. They stand as or these the Acropolis. Or the Acropolis in the Parthenon. Hmm. Uh, in, in Athens, they stand as these monuments of humanity built in ancient times. Well, of course the Brahms for symphony was written in the 19th century, but it stands as a monument. Mm. The Beethoven Ninth is this mass, what I call, again, I call all these things masterpieces of humanity because mm. they have withstood the test of time. Mm. We regard them as masterpieces in the case of the uh, Acropolis, uh, uh, the, the, the Parthenon, uh, we, uh, we admire it and are in awe of it thousands of years later. Mm -hmm. And a hundred and some odd years later, uh, we regard the, the um, Brahms First Symphony or the Beethoven Ninth as this monument, which still makes our mouths drop open in awe. Mm. Gobsmacked. Gobsmacked, completely. Or Da Vinci's Last Supper, mm. or the Mona Lisa. Mm. Or the Art or, of Fugue. Or, or the Art of the Fugue of Bach. And I think, the... I think the magnificent thing about that is that it's incomplete. So I, I've always, always thought of it as a, as a kind of invitation to to continue down signed off with his own name yes b a c a sorry b flat a c and h. b natural yeah yeah, yeah. that's wow. ha to the german for b natural mm. and uh in the uh inner line there 
and just kind of trails off. And what's interesting, the first time I, I the first few performances that I heard of the Art of the Fugue, mm. uh, I heard the ending mm. Mm. Um, that somebody else wrote. Mm. Mm. Nice ending, it's convincing, but of course it's not Bach, so no. And then I remember the first time I ever heard, I think it was Karl Paukert, who was a mentor of mine, mm. Czech virtuoso organist. Mm. And he played it and he ended it just the way it ended in the manuscript. Mm. And I was, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was the most, was most dramatic things I'd ever heard. Agreed, 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 absolutely. I mean, as a rhetorical device, it's akin to a cliffhanger. Sure. And it is almost, a, well, I'll tell you another example. I mean, the first real example I can think of of a 12-tone row mm. is in the final fugue of the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm glad that I mean, you the said actual, that. The actual, the actual fugue subject, I remember we discussed this once, the, the actual fugue, fugue subject, I think, repeats one note, mm. but it's all 12 tones used. Absolutely. And, uh, and it was... And it's the last piece of what was be what became the first volume. He later wrote the second volume, but mm. but uh, and it was Bach's way and his genius of saying, you know, I've just now written preludes and fugues mm. in every tone mm. uh, within an octave of the chromatic scale, and so I'm going to close this set of twelve preludes and fugues with the last piece being the fugue using all twelve tone. 12 tones of the scale of the chromatic scale and and that's and what, that's a show and, that's a showpiece it's a showpiece it's, it's absolute genius but you know the funny thing is uh we said that a great work of art or a master work a masterpiece is timeless i think it also has to be universal and what i really really love well, about what does bach, that mean what does that mean in, in the music? case of in the case of box music box music can be played on anything and it sounds <laughs> like Bach, and it sounds beautiful. I'll give you an example. There is a xylophone uh, that is played by gravity. There's, there's a, a ball that is sent down this, these wooden steps in a forest in Japan, and it plays Bach, but it plays it using gravity, and it sounds absolutely phenomenal, and it sounds like Bach, you see. Um, I've heard Bach played by Jacques Loisier uh, and his trio, and, uh, you know, and it's jazz, but it's, it's also, you know, Bach. I mean, you hear the I, the bass line in the in the basso continuo. You hear um you hear the you hear the the right. pedal tones as as something a double bass would play in in a, in a jazz just, trio, and it's just yes, as hip. Well, I, well, and there's tritone watched, substitutions. I mean, it's it's well, like I just, I, I just watched I just watched a performance of the uh, harpsichord concerto in D minor. Mm. Uh, the orchestra part is played exactly as written, but mm. the solo part is actually played by two uh, marimbas mm -hmm. and it sounds it, well it sounds like Bach it still yes. sounds like Bach yes. by the way I wanted to I wanted to add something to my definition of a masterpiece go ahead I, we started going off on a tangent I left that out so it's not only a, a piece that has withstood the test of time that is mm. still admired greatly centuries later mm. millenniums later but it's also in the case of music or in the case of the painting or the, something in the visual arts, but let's say music, mm. is that every time you hear it, it sounds fresh and new. Yes. Even if it's an old piece yes. that's 200 years old, every time you hear it, mm. it's, there's, there's something about it. It's, it's almost as if you're hearing it for the first time. You never get tired of it. Mm. That's that, that, is to me the definition of a masterpiece mm. that it's, it's still so, awe striking and and fresh and mm, new mm. every time you hear it. So can we say that about uh, Stravinsky's Firebird, for example? Sure, of course. Every time I hear any of the ballets, mm. uh, the Ride of Spring is a piece that I keep on coming to all the time. I I, I restudy that score two or three times a year, mm. and I'll, there's a, there's a reason. It's like playing the Chopin etudes. It's sure. good for your technique, great for your technique. Sure. I think for a conductor, it's like playing the Chopin etudes. Mm -hmm. The Rite of Spring is a very difficult work to conduct. Mm. Uh, well, because of the public. On, 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 on every level. And I think it's great for a conductor's technique to revisit it and restudy it. And also, it's like any 
um, masterpiece. Every time you open it up, you discover something new. Yes. So you get your pencil out and you write. You know what I like to do sometimes is sometimes, well, when I am to perform a work that I've conducted before mm. or played before even, is mm. I buy a new score. Okay. Particularly when works that I've conducted. Well, I keep, I mean, I use the scores I've, when I've played a piece, I've used my own scores because my fingerings are written in there. Mm -hmm. And those really don't change. And that's how you get a piece back into your hands quickly because you've so methodically learned it. Mm -hmm. And my scores are thick with fingerings and mm -hmm. all my markings. And it's the same thing with my conducting Has scores. Has anyone ever complained cool. about your fingering technique? But the thing is, I, the thing about conducting is that I often get a new score mm. and, um, and I start from scratch. Mm. It's like I'm relearning, I'm learning it for the first time. Mm. I mark in my bowings and mark in things that I see. And, mm. and then I compare it to a score that I might have had 10 years ago. Mm. And it's interesting to see the differences. And tell and me I've about discovered, that I've discovered new things. Right, right. Yes, because it's, it's, it's such a rich. Uh, tapestry that you can't really figure it out in yes. in one look. Um, right. I was going to ask you about performance direction, specifically um, regarding world music and and uh, music that has ethnic influence. You know, have you ever come across performance directions that are written in a language that you don't speak or you don't know? Um, and uh, how do you uh, render the composer's intention with fidelity if you, for example? don't know the tradition that they're drawing on, for example. Let's say somebody wrote a piece based on West African polyrhythms, but you didn't know that, you just saw the score. How, how would you be able to glean that or, or learn that? Well, I would do research. Yes. I would read up on everything I could about the subject, uh, mm. the relevant subjects to the yes. piece, which I've yes. performed. Uh, I also have friends who are ethnomusicologists. I would be yes. having a Zoom meeting with them yeah. And picking their brains. Mm. And for me, but you see, any great performing artist, no matter how much experience he or her has, mm. uh, we're all students when you come right down to it. Yes. We're always, I, I mean, one of the most important elements, I think, of any creative artist, of any great artist, mm -hmm. is curiosity. Yes. That's one of the most important characteristics of their personality. Mm. And unfortunately, I mean, I do know perform some performing artists who aren't really very curious. It's mm -hmm. not just being curious about music and style and all that, but it's curious about the world. We can't, you cannot be a great artist and live in a bubble. Yes. Because everything you experience comes out in your performance. Now, mm -hmm. if on a purely technical or historical level, if, uh, if you don't know something, you do research. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very necessary. I think all performers should also be musicologists in that way and historians. I would concur. And, is, and interdisciplinary artists themselves. In other words, they might not be a painter or a writer, but the point is they're interested and curious about it and they look at those uh, mm. extra musical influences that make a piece of music. I mean, if you talk about, I mean, again, I don't, really know much about, about uh, I'm, you know, I'll give you an example. I learned some things about ancient Chinese music. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who is one of the world's great Arhu players. Now an Arhu is a Erhu. single string instrument, but he said Arhu, but Erhu, Arhu. Tomato, tomato, let's call, let's call the whole thing Orf. Anyway, but he, he, um, he had this, um, this, he had one and he demonstrated to me. He said, you know what? And he played some traditional Chinese music on it. And then he said, here's one that'll blow you away. And he played the 24th Caprice of Paganini. And he said, I can play some of the other Caprices of Paganini. And he played it perfectly. I think it was the 24th. It was the famous one, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, the most famous one, and I was absolutely stunned. His intonation was perfect. His style was just perfect. Hmm. And uh, he says, really like a, a single string violin. Yes. 
and yes. and but then he played Chinese music with a lot of also various uh, various kind of interesting sound sound effects that came from his bowing technique, for example. Mm. And of course, you can make you can vary the pitch infinitesimally, mm. but. Um, uh, so he taught me about something I never knew before, but made me intensely curious hmm. about it. And so if I was going to, like, let's say an African composer said, I'm writing a piece of music for orchestra, but also with traditional instruments. Hmm. And it combines all these uh, indigenous polyrhythms to, uh, from the region from where I come and that have been passed down from generations to generations, I would have to really pick his mind and, and have him teach me because it's not my own Western tradition. But the point is I would be intensely curious about it and I would want to know everything I could. Hmm. Well, well, that's, that's refreshing, uh, refreshing. That's refreshing. Refre refreshing? <laughs> have another glass of wine to refreshing, <laughs> refresh us. <laughs> oh, boy. Refresh, to refresh and then yourself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, well, my, but my, my, saying, my technique, my technique is going out the window. My linguistic no, technique. No, it's perfect. Right, perfect <laughs> it's late in the afternoon, you know, it's coming up to dinner time. But, I, but the, oh, I was going to tell you something else. Mm. And even within our own Western traditions, for example, when you ask about what happens if I do something that's uh, that where the language, the um, express, the the performance the directions, the score are are in a different language. Well, I'll mm. give you an example. I mean, a few years ago, I conducted uh, Tchaikovsky's opera Evgeny Onegin, mm -hmm. and I had never conducted a Russian opera before, mm. and it was my first, and I conducted it in Russia, mm. and it was a really life transforming experience. First of all, I mean, I knew parts of the score for years early before that, but here I had to learn, I spent my summer vacation um, at home in Greece. And my, I spent part of the year there uh, in the summers. And uh, I spent my summer vacation working on the score, which I had to conduct uh, about two months later. Mm. And now I don't speak Russian, but of course I learned the English translation to make sure I knew what everybody was saying. Uh, I taught myself the Cyrillic alphabet so that at least I could follow the score and know how things were performed. Or, sorry, pronounced. Right, right. I, did, I didn't know the actual Russian language, mm. but I could, I could kind of mouth phonetically the words mm. so mm. that I was with the singers. And of course, I wrote the English translation underneath so right. that I knew exactly what they were singing when they were singing it. Hmm. So uh, essentially, you do your research. There's no substitute for that. Oh, there's absolutely, I was about to say, there's no substitute. You took the words right out of my mouth. There's no substitute for that. And, and, a, and a, a musician who doesn't have that kind of curiosity, innate or informed, hmm. um, I think is missing the boat. Indeed, indeed. Yes. So I wanted to ask you about meritocracy and specifically, uh, specifically how it applies uh, in a musical context, whether, whether, whether meritocracy is something musicians should strive towards or work towards um, and how you think it applies in, in, uh, in various contexts. Well, meritocracy on its own, let's get a good old Webster's definition. The, the, the achievement of influence and power mm. and uh, uh, position mm. based on one's merits. Mm. Um, it's nothing new, I mean, the you can go all the way back to Confucius for reference of references of meritocracy. Mm, and of course, true. Plato, Plato talks about, of course, not using the word, they didn't use the word meritocracy. Mm. Plato uh, refers to the acquisition of power and position in the Republic. Yes. Uh, but the word itself, um, 
as far as we know it, well, was plus, coined, yeah, was cracked. coined, was coined, yeah. was coined in in um, in a book from the late 1950s by uh, Michael Dunlop Young, and I remember reading it. It was it was called the the rise of meritocracy. I haven't read it for a long time. Sure, sure. And was and so he's the one who really coined the word, yes. the actual word in this. And what's interesting is yeah. that he appellated uh, it essentially. Yes, but and the what idea was has been around. What, yeah. what, but what's interesting, the same year, Hannah Arendt also wrote a, a treatise called The Crisis of Education, in which she t- uses the word meritocracy. Mm. And, her, and, and that dealt with, in her, in her treatise, it dealt with um, the educational system in England mm. and how people who had reached a certain level, that that was the, um, the way of moving up in government. Yes. Example. Uh, and what also is interesting about that is that um, there was an actual kind of a formula in a way. Um, how do I put this? For Michael Dun- Dun- Dunlop Young, his idea of meritocracy had to do with intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, intelligence and what he termed innate or cultivated en- en- energy, energy, mm-hmm. and that so that meritocracy was the summation, was the achievement of both of these qualities, intelligence and energy. But um, Hannah Arendt and others actually added to it, and they said that meritocracy was a combination of culture, experience, and intelligence mm-hmm. and energy. Mm-hmm. Right now. So the, 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 effort, I mean, the efforts are important too, because in order to achieve all those things, you have to put in an enormous amount of effort. And discipline. Yes. Uh, but so the idea, of, look, I mean, it's, the, it's basically the foundation of people achieving a certain position in life mm. is that they are the summation of their achievements, of their merits, right? Mm-hmm. Some, and uh, I think that line I mean, you look at the people who've achieved great things in history, mm-hmm. in, in the arts, in education, in the sciences. They've, they've established themselves through, their, through a lifetime, a body of achievement, a lifetime body of achievement. Mm. Uh, that has become somewhat blurred uh, due to the internet, because some people have... Well, we live in a post-meritocratic society. That much is evident. Well, I don't know whether... No, I think we're still very much in a merit... Uh, in a... In a, in a, in a, metro, in a metocracy. But I think the lines have become blurred. The, mm-hmm. the, the process is different. For example, there are... Well, let's take my field of music. There are some musicians who create... Or even outside of music. There are some people who earn money by putting YouTube videos of their pets. And because everybody likes those feel good pet videos, the next thing you know is they have a million subscribers and they're generating income because there are ads that they use on the middle of their golden retriever puppies doing whatever, you know, and uh, they earn money that way. Now, maybe it takes a little bit of talent to make a good video. Certainly it's a creative act unto itself. But then look at, in my field, in music, there are people who put one video after another online of them playing a piece and and they're very theatrical they smile when the music is happy they go like this you know they look they have all these facial gymnastics and theatrics going on but if you close your eyes and you just listen this is the real test you Uh just close your eyes and listen many times you hear performances which are not extraordinary at all in fact are rather mediocre but you see this sort of theatrical presentation going on. Yes, the gratuitous, uh, the gratuitous expressions of... of... Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and yet, and maybe a few of them might get a couple of performances from it mm. eventually, but this is how they, they, for them, this is a career. Well, the reality of it is it's no career mm-hmm. because a career is being invited to perform in front of live audiences somewhere. And you can put out a hundred videos, but if you're only getting 
a few performances out of it. And you and it's all theatrics. It's wearing a certain kind of an outfit and it's making these super over emotional faces to show that you're feeling the music. But if what a person hears is no expression or feeling, it doesn't mean it's just bullshit. Well, music and, is after all an oral art form. Absolutely. And so this is, um, th for, for these people, their version of meritocracy, their merit mm -hmm. is the fact that they flooded their vlog channel or their YouTube channel or their mm -hmm. vlogs or their performance thing. They flooded it with content. Yeah, or but, their Instagram. But it's, yes, but you see all of that is actually a myth in a way mm -hmm. because like for, for example on instagram i'm not an instagram personally but uh but i've seen it and it's flooded with millions of people i mean if you want to look up pianists you have millions of pianists mm -hmm. doing the exact same thing yes or violinists or singers or somebody doing um an aerobic video mm -hmm. you'll find millions of people doing that and a lot of people just putting pictures of themselves one after the other and you know it's it's just one big blur and ultimately i don't know if it really means very much because mm -hmm. it's it's an instant form of gratification mm -hmm. and it comes and goes in the blinking of an eye yes well it's a kind of sickness i don't think it's a sickness I think it's people. You know, I know it is a sickness. It's a, it's a, it's an well, obsession. What would well, define that? Define that. Let's uh, maybe I just need to hear your definition of why it's how it's a sickness or what kind of sickness. It is. Well, it's unhealthy. I mean, to be to be so focused on the perception of the self and and mm. how how that is created and generated by you know likes and sharing. I mean, it's there's there's studies that have shown that every time you get a like, it's a hit of dopamine. You know, in in your uh, in your in your mind, in your brain, and so what happens is that much like a drug, like cocaine or or anything else, it's addictive. Exactly, and and so you're basically creating this system of rewards, which social media is actually gaming, in order to increase their profits, in, in order to sell stuff, in order to. I mean, inst you know, Instagram and Facebook are free. They're free. Nothing's ever free. They're selling your information ten times over. You know, you're yes. you're you're basically. You're being gamed and you're being marketed. You're you're a piece of, you're a piece of data. It's 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 objectification on a grand grand scale, and so humans therefore uh, start to objectify, thinking that is the norm. That is a sickness. It is a it is a psychosis. Of yes, kind. yes, and it's here to stay. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately. But I mean, if people get their jollies out of being liked by followers some who know them personally some who don't all right you know there's nothing you can do with that but i think i prefer the real world I prefer, absolutely i prefer you know when somebody comes up to me after performance and saying that was so beautiful it made me cry mm -hmm. i cry when they tell me that mm -hmm. you know because that's my goal in life is to bring beauty into people's lives mm -hmm. through music to touch and their to be hearts good Yes. yes, to touch their hearts and really bring beauty into their lives because right now mm -hmm. the world is suffering big time. And, yes. and uh, you know, it's interesting because we've been talking about meritocracy in a kind of a negative way. Mm -hmm. But I forgot to mention that there was another writer, uh, I think his name was Daniel Bell, who felt that meritocracy was a positive thing. Mm -hmm. I think he was the one, sorry, I think he was the one who said it was a combination of a culture and intelligence and experience. Mm. And yes, it was him. Yeah. Um, I just well, remember trying to remember everything I read on this subject. It's interesting well, about that. It's it's based on this idea of the rule of the best, right? Yeah. The, the, the 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 rule of the best. I mean, an aristocrat will tell you the same thing. Uh, you know, that yeah. the, the the best people rule, but of course, with an aristocracy, that that has nothing to do with no. merit. You said the best people rule. No, the rule of the best. The rule of the ones who've achieved the most merit. Yes, but that, that's a meritocracy. I'm, I'm saying that an aristocracy is, is in fact... But it doesn't mean... It does, but it, well, an aristocracy, first of all, uh, let's say, for example, a monarchy. That's, mm -hmm. That is not a meritocracy at all because those people 
were born into their position. They didn't earn it. Exactly. And by the way, by the way, the that's that's what I think should be stressed. Mm. The root of the word meritocracy is the Greek. I think it's the ancient Greek is um, mereo, which means earn. Mm -hmm. You see. So that's the basis of meritocracy, of a meritocracy, is that you've earned your position through your achievements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, yes, and I, I think I know, the, it's, yeah. it's funny. It's it's my it's, yeah. it's my pedagogical side. I can't simply, I can't. You know, if you ask me the meaning of a word, I can't just simply say it means this or that. Yes. I have to go into the into the root of it and the well. It's good that you. It. It's good that you brought up etymology because that leads very gracefully into my question about the etymology of sound. But I was going to say that etymology is actually very important. Uh, you know, linguistically, uh, when you think about ideas, because the origin of the idea, or the, or the origin of the articulation, the appellation of that idea, uh, inform, yeah. informs how you see it, like the word autodidact, auto meaning yes. self and didactus meaning learn. Um, you yeah. know, I, I think, I think people that are not native English speakers, but for example, studied Latin, actually understand mm -hmm. the language better than some native English speakers. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, yes. Well, I mean, I had a, I had a friend, a German girl, a saxophonist, and uh, you know, I I used the word autodidact, and she instantly told me what it meant. And I said, "How did you do that?" She says, "Well, I studied Latin, and we studied that in school, and that's part of our curriculum." Yes. Oh, okay. Now, did you hear when you were? Did you get that when you were in school in India? No, in fact, I uh, this was in Nova Scotia, and uh, in I, I think a lot of people know about you that you actually attended school in India. I did indeed. Uh, was that high school, the equivalent of, of what we think of high school? Yes, it was, was grade, it? grade nine and grade 10. Uh, so yes, it was high school. Was that an international school? Yeah, it was actually a mission school. It was a Christian, uh, a Christian mission school. Um, oh, okay. So it had That's been established. Right. Yeah, it had been established by missionaries. But it is, it is now an international school, although it still retains its Christian roots and its Christian identity. And in fact, it's the place where I first encountered the pipe organ. That's right, and what, because they had one there at the school. Exactly, they had a, a, a one manual eight stop Hill and Sons. From England, yes, of course. I don't think uh, pipe organs are particularly prevalent in India. No, I mean, they, they do exist, of course, because um, there are churches, uh, but many of them are in disrepair and man, many of them are, are unfortunately not functional. Uh, but, but, but Christianity is quite prevalent in India. There are many Indian Christians. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So, so I suppose my question about the etymology of sound, um, you know, is, well, it's something that you and I have discussed uh, at length, uh, and yes. I think it would be very nice uh, to hear your thoughts about, you know, the origins, the etymology of sound, and, and how that influences us as as thinkers, as artists. Well, I, hmm. I think, first of all, one has to understand etymology and sound because curiously enough they have their both of those words and their meanings have something in common hmm. uh, etymology comes from the greek etymologia Study which means origins. the origins of words mm -hmm. but the the uh, root of that etymu means a sense of truth. Now, the word sound comes from the Latin sonare, yes. which also has um, a medieval French uh, Application. word connected to it, which is sonu, mm -hmm. which, like means, from sonore, which means which means it means two things. It means not only sound, it means the search for truth. The search for truth. So you have the Greek, when you say the etymology sound, I mean, it's the search I just for can't truth. Help, I, truth. Can't, I, can't, I can't just help notice the connection is that one is the sense of truth, the Greek, and the French for, for etym 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 etymologia, and uh, with the Greek etym etymu, which means the sense of truth. And the root of the word sound, which means both sound and the search for truth. Now, the thing is about sound itself, I mean, Busoni, Ferruccio Busoni, 
who was a very famous classical pianist, for those who don't know who he was, and also composer. He lived here in Berlin, and he's buried here in Berlin, actually. Mm. Um, but he said a couple of very interesting things about music in relation to sound. He said, music is sonorous air. Mm. Think of that. Music is sonorous air. Mm. And um, mm. he also... How eloquent. Yes, and he also said, music is the art, let's see if I have to do it. Music is the art of sounds and the movement of time. Yes, so he's expounding on that uh, first idea. Well, I, I don't know which, I don't know which of those ideas came first. Mm. Uh, mm. Just getting comfortable on my couch here. I don't know which of those sounds came first. Mm. Uh, chicken or the egg, you know. Exactly. Uh, which one of those, I, I don't know which one of those, sorry, expressions came first. Yes. Is it music is the art of sounds and the movement of time or music is sonorous air. I don't know which one he said first, mm. but they're both related. Mm. Now, now, but sound as we know it, first of all, at its root, sound is created by vibration, mm -hmm. right? It's a frequency. Music. It's a wavelength. By, no, by, by, well, by, by actual vibration. Physics identifies it as such. Not only fre frequency is a vibration of sorts. But the thing is, uh, music is the, is the organization of those vibrations. Mm -hmm. And depending on how they're organized, I'm just going to the very basic level. I'm not going into any great detail how they're organized, it makes us feel exaltation, joy, or sadness. It touches us, it makes us cry. How these sounds, how these vibrations are organized, which of course gets into the tonal system and everything else. And physics, you see, and the, the basic of, root of sound is in nature. Yes. I mean, and the science that defines it is of course physics. For example, when there is an earthquake, people have often said that, who've experienced earthquakes, that there was a low rumble. Many people, including some musicians who have uh, been in earthquakes, said they actually heard from the earth an, an actual pitch mm -hmm. or a set of pitches. Well, the, one of the ways they detect, one of the ways they detect tectonic shift is exactly doing that. They use microphones to listen to that. Uh, to the shifting. Yes, they hear rumble. That's right. But the fact that this rumble can be defined by, if you have perfect pitch, you can say, oh, that's a low E or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what we feel, the shaking of the room, is the vibration. Mm -hmm. Now, I have in the back of my uh, house here uh, a lot of trees, mm -hmm. big trees. And in the morning, in the summer, for example, uh, if I wake up early enough, I start to hear the birds sing. Mm. One starts, another one joins, and within an hour, actually within a very short time of that, not even an hour, 10 minutes, all the birds in the trees have joined in. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, you start to hear a pattern. And I remember I got up early in the morning for about a week. I wanted to to see if it repeated itself. And sure enough, I began to hear the same patterns repeating themselves in successive days. Not continuous, not, not, not exactly the day before, but I picked up things I kind of heard the day before. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that's one of the beauties of God's creation. One of those birds starts, another one joins in before you have a, a whole chorus. And this is the sound of nature. Uh, the frequencies that they've been picking up lately in outer space, they've heard certain pitches, hummings. Some, we don't know, we don't, they have theories of where it comes from, where these things come from. Yeah. Uh, some say it's the death of a star and it produces a kind of a radio frequency. And they mm -hmm. pick up the... Or, or, a, or a black hole. I mean, one of the ways that we know about black holes is because of yes. event, event horizons and the frequencies, because you cannot see right. a black hole. Well, they've just discovered another one, and they're not sure where it's coming from. Mm. Uh, how many light years away it is, millions mm. of light years. 
but they picked it up. And and if you go on YouTube, you can actually hear the you know, sounds like, wow. yep. maybe it's the aliens talking. I took a very bad imitation, yeah. but you get the idea. <laughs> there's there's a specific pitch involved. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's easy, it's it's one thing to talk about the nature here on Earth mm. having its own sounds, mm. the rumble, of, you know, the low the low rumble of an earthquake, mm -hmm. or the high pitches of the birds, mm -hmm. or for example, this, the sound the sound of the ocean, which I think is the world's great the nature's greatest aleatoric sound installation. Yes, but here these these frequencies that they're measuring are coming from the universe. Yes. So uh, the etymology of sound, I would have to say, is Or nature. from the past universe. Right. From the, the past etymology, universe. meaning the origin. Mm. The etymology means the origins of words, of course, mm -hmm. and et etymology and so forth. And the sense of truth, mm -hmm. going down to the real root of the Greek word, etymol. Mm. And so the sense of truth, the truth of sound mm. is in nature. Mm. 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 These vibrations which create either pitches or percussive sound or anything. You know, it's, it's it, the, the etymology of sound is, is it's, it just has all of its roots in nature. And so you're, music, so you're, a great, as, you're a great philosopher and a musicologist. Should we add that to your resume? Well, I don't know if I'm a philosopher in terms, I mean, I just simply stated what I think is actually a fact, you know, it's not, a, it's, in other words, it's not a theory. Yes, I it know. is a fact. It is a fact. But of course, the great the philosophers physics. deal, the great philosophers deal with fact. Of course, I mean, uh, philosophy being a, a kind of an outgrowth and an exponent of, of science, really, um, it well, is a way of understanding the world. Well, Busoni was a, was a philosopher in that mm. sense. You know, he actually, his definition, mm. music is sonorous air, mm. and music is the art of sounds and the movement of time. And that's also so poetry. It's poetic, incredibly poetic, but, uh, you know, philosophy is poetic. Indeed, at, at, its, at, its, at its best, it is. I mean, you look Plato, at the Aristotle, Plato, Confucius, that's right, the discourses. Exactly. Rumi. Rumi, yeah. No, I mean, you look Rab at it. Rabindranath Tagore. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know something? I it's have here, left. I have here Tagore's book called Fireflies. Mm -hmm. And um, he has the he has the beard, so he really must be a sage. Well, the thing is, uh, <laughs> I was introduced to this book when I was a child yeah. by my piano teacher, Gavin Williamson, who is a great mm -hmm. intellectual as well as being one of the world's great, greatest musical artists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Here, this is, listen to this. This is something of Tagore. Mm -hmm. We gain freedom when we have paid the full price for our right to live. You, you, should, you should get this, Fireflies, by either, I've always said Rabindranath, maybe it's Rabindranath, I don't know, Rabindranath. Well, Tagore. you know, this is, this, is, this is Vedic, this is Vedic wisdom. And the greatest wisdom of humanity is contained in Sanskrit and in the Vedas. Yes. Well, anyway, but I, I, I don't know the roots of this, of, mm -hmm. of his expressions, but it's, uh, but we gain freedom when we have paid the full price for our right to live. Yeah. Do you know, I recently, yeah. your careless gifts of your careless gifts of a moment, like the meteors of an autumn night, catch fire in the depth of my being. Ah, isn't that beautiful? And, you know, but, but I, I have, so I have this here on my coffee table in my living room mm -hmm. but uh, I also for example uh, by my bed mm. uh, are the Shakespeare sonnets mm. which I think also are great philosophy po poetry first and foremost yes and philosophy but also they're philosophic well I want to share uh, this absolutely incredible uh, poet with you his name is Ibn Arabi um, mm -hmm. and uh, He's considered one of the great thinkers of Islam from the golden age of Islam. And uh, his poem, uh, My Religion is Love, is, is, is well, I'll, I'll let you decide. I'll read it to you. I mean, to me, it's, it's one of the most seminal texts of, of any great Sufi. He recognized the oneness, the unity of all beings, all creatures, all religions. And, and, he, and he realized that form 
was a kind of play, but really the truth of everything is formlessness and love. So here, here's what he says. He says, my heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture for gazelles and a, a covenant for Christian monks and a temple for idols and the pilgrims Kaaba and the tables of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love wherever, uh, whatever way love's camel take. That is my religion and faith. Um, and of course, this has been translated many, many ways. Uh, but essentially, the, the form tells you that he doesn't, he doesn't see the differences. He doesn't see the distinctions as, as it's very, being it's relevant. Very, it's, it's a very humanist statement. Exactly. Much like the, 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 the poem by, uh, uh, who is the, no, no, the, the poem, the poem that's in front of the, the door at the United Nations. Um, uh, it's, it's by Sadi. Uh, that if you cannot feel the pain of another human being, you're not worthy of being called human. This is on the door of the United wow, Nations. Wow, that's very powerful. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is written on the on the door of the U United Nations, uh, and it's absolutely profound when you think about and it. And I could add, and you know, that yeah. statement can be applied to to us musicians. We can't yes. form a piece with all of its emotion and, and humanity and divinity yeah. if we cannot empathize with our fellow human beings. Absolutely. And feel, and feel what they feel. Absolutely, and, and listen, listen to this. Um, th this is the whole poem. And this is, again, this is in New York in the UN building. Uh, this, this, is the, uh, this is the translation from Farsi. It was written in Persian, obviously. Oh, really, um, okay. Yeah, so human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you've no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Can you start? Can you say that whole thing? Say that whole thing again. Human, sure I... human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you've no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Hmm. And this is written. And this is written on the UN uh, uh, building, right, right at the entrance. That's really beautiful. I find the first couple of lines of that especially powerful. Because it means we're all part of one human family. Absolutely. And of course, families are the unit within a society that are the closest interrelation. And we forget that all the time. It's yeah. like it's like it's like the. Uh, How can like you hurt chaos. another human being if if they're part of you? If you're the part of your if they're part of your. I mean, well, when you do hurt another human being, the effects of it are far ranging. It's yeah. like chaos theory, where if you take a pebble, and you throw it into a lake, and it, the ripples, and the ripples that maybe the ripples then reach the river that it's connected to, which then go into the ocean, mm. which eventually uh, sends its vibration to another continent on the other side. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think when you, when you hurt somebody, mm. you've affected their whole lives. And maybe the way that they behave towards another human being, which means what you've done has now reached yet a third person, which will reach another person and influence this occurrence and that occurrence and see, uh, which- Well, the, the reverberations of history. A, well, which all has to do again with the sound. etymology of sound, which is exactly. vibration. Yes. Which in other words, those vibrations affect something that's connected to it, something it reaches, which then vibrates to something else and vibrates to, to yet something else without sounding redundant but in other words it continues and that's, on and that's the thing history reverberates and echoes time and memoriam that's one yes, of the ways does. that's one of the ways we contain our histories isn't sound right even after we're gone ars longa vita brevis art is long or forever mm. and life is short yes and you see that's the thing i mean uh the when we talked about Instagram, which is the mm. pursuit of, I don't know, I think it has all has look to do at me, with- Look at me, look at me. 
Well, no, it's, it's, it's even deeper than that. And, and people may not even realize uh, that it's deeper than that, but it all, I mean, look, I'll give you an example. When we all of a sudden were on lockdown, on the first lockdown, especially, hmm. uh, when was that, 2020? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, performing artists all around the world started putting one video after another on. Yeah. Some a video a day or, yes. or more. Facebook, people who are well-known, people who are not well-known. And you know, it's interesting, I, I couldn't bear to watch them. Uh, some, some, some of my closest friends put on videos, I could only watch it for a minute or two and I had to turn it off. Mm -hmm. First of all, one thing that, that was very painful for, to, to watch mm -hmm. were performances taking place in empty halls. Mm -hmm. um, I'm leading into the whole social media thing, mm -hmm. but, but this is what the first thing that appeared was that, I mean, I'll never get watching a concert online in a major opera house, mm. a singer on stage with a string quartet and piano. Mm. And everybody was the, the instrumentalists were all dressed, all, were all dressed in black mm. and she was wearing a lovely gown mm. and she sang some piece of music and she ended, ended with a great ah! like this and she finished mm. and she had a smile and it, all of a sudden it disappeared from her face in a way that was alarming. And then the camera zoomed in the room, all the lights were off in the hall, but you could still see it from the lights of the stage. And this was a, this was a big opera house and it was completely empty. There was no applause. And the smile dis disappeared from her face. And I thought to myself, you know, She's just given this performance. Hmm. Nobody's clapping. There's no one there to complete that end of the feedback loop. There, there is a cameraman holding a video camera, filming it. Hmm. And obviously there must be a sound engineer because the sound was very, very good and hmm. very balanced. Hmm. And I saw this kind of look of sadness on her eyes. Hmm. So, and this repeated during that first lockdown in particular, this was repeating itself all the time. People were giving performances in empty halls. And then one video after another of people performing from their homes. And you know what? I couldn't watch it. It was so painful. I thought it was so sad. And, and one thing that was sad about it was there, it, there was almost a desperation. And the desperation wasn't to make music as because you can, you know, I think the desperation was to remain relevant. Mm. Mm. I, do you still love me? Do you still think I'm relevant as an artist? Do you still want to hear my music? And, and I'm not saying anything bad about it. I think it was something we all felt. Mm -hmm. uh, or or contemplated. I, oh. I didn't feel that. I, I personally didn't feel that. Mm -hmm. I, I felt that, I, and I know, I mean, cause I did talk with friends of mine who were musicians who mm -hmm. were terribly afraid that it would be, that they would never come back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, that, that this was the end of this music. This would be the end of them, yeah. This would be the end of music. The end of music, yeah. Of live performance. Mm -hmm. They thought, this, what happens if this is going on for the next few years? And of course, a lot of it was, a lot of it was existential. How will I earn a living? Mm -hmm. um, but much of it, of, I think the most of it was psychological. Yeah. And my attitude was, you know, this is temporary. It's going to come back. The engagements will come back. Mm -hmm. Everything will be fine. And I mean, I had no desire to put any videos online. I did put a few, but I was invited to do it. I mean, one, for example, was for the, the Galitana Festival where I'm artist in residence. And this, this is a very important part of my life. It's Malta and specifically Gozo Island has become, and the festival has become an artistic home for me. Mm -hmm. And not just an artistic home for me, but because I have so many friends on the island that I've made over the, over 13 years that I've been going there. Mm. Uh, and so they asked me 
and some other people to make a video, first of all, saying some encouraging words mm. for people who attended the concerts, the mm. patrons and so forth, mm. and, the, and the staff of the festival. Mm. And I, this was in the first few weeks of the lockdown. And I remember the day that I made the video for them. Mm. I filmed it in, here in, at home in my studio. Mm. And, and I was thinking, what should I play? Should I play Chopin? Should I play Liszt or Rachmaninoff or something? And early in the day, I just decided to take a walk. And we were actually, I think we were, everybody was encouraged to stay home. Not, this is before they said, go outside and exercise. And I live near a very busy boulevard mm. here in Berlin. Mm. And I walked down the street and I was the only person on the street. There were no cars. Mm. It was like a ghost town. Mm. And I said this on the video. Mm. I told the story and I said just earlier today, mm. I was walking down the street. I was the only person everywhere I looked. I didn't see another human being on the street where this normally full of people and full of cars. There were no cars. Mm. There were no people. And for a minute, I thought, this is how it must be. This is like one of those science fiction movies yeah, it's where the you apocalypse. Wake up and everybody's gone, but there are no bodies or anything. Everybody's just disappeared. Yeah. You were the only person alive on earth. You are all alone. Yeah. And for a moment, that's how I felt. And it was a profound experience. Mm. And I just couldn't imagine it. Just incredible. And so I told this story on, on my video. And I said, you know, I've been trying to figure out what I should play for you. Mm. And for some reason, what comes to mind is not any piece of piano music. Hmm. I could play the organ in my studio as well, but I was at the piano. I said, but a song by Leonard Bernstein called Lonely Town. Hmm. And, uh, and I quoted the text. Hmm. Um, um, and which you know talks about, for example, you walk past a thousand eyes and yet nobody looks at you. Hmm. You know, but you are you see a thousand people, a thousand, sorry, here's what it is a thought it's been a long time. A thousand people flash before your eyes. Hmm. And yet it's a lonely town, unless there's love. Hmm. See? And I quoted the whole text of the song and then I played it. And I, I all, but right before that, I told the story about being on the street alone and feeling completely alone. And I said, I said to everybody, don't worry, the festival will come back. We'll all be together again, we'll be experiencing music together and friendship together. And then I played this piece hmm. after also quoting the text. And do you know that I got so many I, it was on the, the festival put it on Facebook and you know I got so many private messages from people telling me that they were in tears just completely in tears after I said the text mm. and then I played the song because everybody was feeling so alone at that moment mm. and I somehow verbalized and also through music mm. uh the search for truth you've captured that spirit the, the etymology of sound and and poetry and everything else and but people people wrote, said that uh, one woman wrote to me and she said i was sobbing mm. and then um so i made that was the first video i did and then when i was um uh playing at the american cathedral in paris this past year in march and april uh, I made four videos at the organ there that they asked me to do. Hmm. And, um, and then, so it was those five videos that I made, but I don't think I would have ever made a video on my own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because first of all, I just felt for me, watching all those other videos made me terribly sad. And I could never, I never finished a single one. Friends of mine said, will you watch this? Will you watch that? And, mm. and then I, was, I would see something posted online. And most of them, I finally, I didn't watch. I couldn't watch it. I couldn't bear it. 
I felt there was something so terribly sad. Mm -hmm. Everybody just saying, don't forget, don't forget me. Oh, it, broke, pas. it broke my heart. N'oublie huh? pas. N'oublie pas. Don't forget. Oui, oui, oui. oui. J'ai oublié. <laughs> you know, you don't want to ever hear that. I forgot. Mm -hmm. J'ai oublié. Mm -hmm. I forgot it. Mm -hmm. I never forgot anybody. And that's the whole point. I don't think anybody would have ever been forgotten. It was just a pause, you see. But it was terribly heartbreaking. Terribly heartbreaking to do. And to, to watch. I just couldn't bear it. And so what I did during the, the lockdown, and the second lockdown, I learned new music. I just played for myself, you know. I studied, I learned a couple of new symphonies. I learned some new piano and organ pieces. I read a lot of books. Uh, during that first lockdown, how long, were, how long was that? Almost. Uh, well, the second lock, I'll tell you, the second lockdown was long. That was November until May. Mm -hmm. And I read, and this is not an exaggeration, I read about 40 books, mm -hmm. all kinds, you know, novels and books on history. I mean, I just, my Amazon bill was quite large. <laughs> and of course, I have, I, have a, I have hundreds of books here at home, but uh, I, there are many things I wanted to read, which I hadn't read yet, and I did. And I learned new pieces. I watched movies that I'd always wanted to see before, or, or movies that uh, um, I had watched years ago that I wanted to revisit. You know, I kept in touch with friends and family on, on uh, Zoom and Skype and so forth. But I couldn't bear to watch a music video from someone's home or, or, or a concert in an empty hall. Mm. I just couldn't. Mm. You see, because a live performance, it all has to do with that relationship between the people on the stage and the people sitting there, the audience, because mm. we give an energy to the audience from the, mu from the music, a physical energy, a, an emotional energy, and they give us something back. We sense their energy coming back at us, their reaction, the warmth during a piece. When you play something beautifully and, it's, and it touches you, you know it touches them. When uh, you feel this wave of energy that comes back to you. Yes. It's, it's, it's that circuit which is completed. Well, it's interesting because Glenn- it's a three, it's a, Let me just say, it's a three-way circuit. It's the composer, mm -hmm coming through the performers, mm. going to the audience, mm. and then coming back to the stage. Mm. And it's missing in a video of a concert in mm. an empty room. Well, it's funny because it's I think Glenn Gould, Glenn Gould would have loved this time because he hated performing for audiences. Oh, he felt audiences. I couldn't believe it. Have you heard that interview where he says yeah. that audiences are evil? It's yeah, it's a blood sport. Yeah, yeah. You see, he, he uses the word evil. Yeah, yeah, I know. I yeah. couldn't believe when I heard him say that. Yeah. But he was, um, he was eccentric, you know. I, I <laughs> he was eccentric. You know, he, he, he made up people to review his own music. He, had a, he, had a, he penned a fake conductor called Sir Nigel Thornwit, who would write. Yes, I know. I've seen, I've seen the skit. Yeah. He was a wonderful actor. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's but, funny. It's funny because Leonard Leonard, Leonard Bernstein uh, said of of Gould in this particular performance, because I respect him as an artist, uh, I'm allowing him to you know do this weird interpretation at half the speed. Um, but I completely disavow it as a as a conductor. It's not my interpretation. Uh, well, he's the he's I, the boss in this. Yes, case. well, I I know the story of that, of course, and it's just, it's actually now a well known story. It, yeah. uh, it was the Brahms first piano concerto which Gould had played with the New York Philharmonic with, uh -huh. with Lenny conducting. And uh, apparently though that performance was that was recorded wasn't so slow. The beginning is a bit slow, but it, it picks up. The night before, the reason why he made the speech is because it, it, it turns out it was the second or third, the second performance they had done of it in the subscription concerts that, that week. Sure. The night before, the first time they played it was just unbelievably slow. It was a dirge. It was a funeral. Oh, dirge. incredibly slow. Everything about it was just twice as slow as what was on the recording that's been released, commercially mm -hmm. released. Mm -hmm. And so the second night, and both Lenny and Gould 
both Bernstein and Gould confirmed this. Bernstein had said to Gould, I, I want to make a little statement. And he did run the statement by Gould and Gould said, fine. And they both have said this and both of them have said this in interviews. It was, they completely cleared with the other. And so Bernstein got on stage and he said, it was a disclaimer in a way. He said, I disagree with this, but I do find things in it. And he said, I do find things in it that are fresh mm. and stimulating. I, I'm paraphrasing. I don't think he uses the word stimulating, but he did say fresh. Mm. And uh, that, that Gould was such a relevant artist that he feels that this interpretation, though it might be something that, he, that Bernstein had a difficult time coping with, mm. with uh, that, that uh, he felt it should be heard. And I think that was a perfectly democratic and uh, legitimate statement to make. Yeah. I don't know whether it was, I, I and I think it probably was necessary in this case. Mm -hmm. but, but he also said, you know, this is Glenn Gould. So nobody well, should he be didn't, surprised. Well, he didn't, disavow, <laughs> he didn't disavow it necessarily, but he didn't claim it either. Well, he said that, he, that there were things that he definitely disagreed with. Yes. Uh, he said he said the concept was entirely foreign to him, mm -hmm. or most of it was, or mm -hmm. a great deal of it was enough to make enough to warrant that disclaimer. The statement, sure. But but he but he said that he was he didn't he wasn't going to give it to an assistant. He was going to do it himself, which means he jumped in with both feet, mm -hmm. which means he tried something new. But but the the other message that wasn't that was sort of said a little bit but wasn't completely enunciated was that this is Glenn Gould. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be what it's going to be and it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, if it was uh, Rubenstein and if Rubenstein had come forth with this kind of interpretation, which he wouldn't have, but, but uh, people would have been totally, if, if Rubenstein had played it that way, or at least the way it was in the very first performance, the first night, people would have been totally horrified and shocked because it would be so unlike Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. But the fact it was Glenn Gould, who already had a reputation for reinterpreting things in a new way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't entirely by surprise. And that was mm -hmm. also the message of Bernstein's mm -hmm. uh, commentary at the beginning yes. of that yes. performance. But that was the second performance that was recorded. Mm -hmm. The first night was the one that was unbelievably slow, like a huge ocean liner in the middle of the sea. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would like to, uh, to thank you very, very much. Why are we stopping? Huh. Uh, because I'm actually feeling uh, hungry and, and, uh, oh, and, and I need to... I should have. Well, I, I actually did eat before, but uh, but it, it is dinner time here uh, in in, Tanz okay. in Tanzania. And uh, I hey, think that could, can... that could be the name of the song, "Dinner Time in Tanzania." Yes, yes, yes. A series of standards, "Dinner Time in Tanzania." There you go. Yeah, we can, we go. we we will do a part two to this. I I do want. To... I was about to say we should. We're not finished. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly don't think like that. Yes, but well, we well, did cover an awful. We did cover an awful lot of ground. I think so. I think so. I think so. And and I'm very very grateful uh, that you shared your ethos, pathos, and logos with us. Well, the, the I in, in summation, I have to say that art always changes. Yes. But uh, the thing that's constant is that it's a very invaluable an extraordinarily important part of everybody's life. Yes. C'est une démonstration de la richesse de... Yeah. C'est une démonstration de la richesse de la culture. I mean, you don't judge... Okay. A, a, doesn't, you, don't, you don't judge a culture by, you know, how much yeah. money it has. I mean, you judge it by its art. You judge it by its monuments, by its literature. That's, that's how people will remember things. And, uh, yeah. and, and let us never forget that. Culture is not a frill. Uh, culture is not the thing that is, uh, you know, a luxury. It's a necessity, and it's an inherent part of being human. That's right. Oh, I wish everybody thought that way. Now, unfortunately, we have politicians who feel that culture is um, something that's completely secondary, and maybe even the first thing we cut from our budget: music and art. 
we we lift up sports all the time because alumni dollars come from that. Yeah. But and you know, unfortunately, it happens. Well, unfortunately, it happens at a very young level in terms of mm. students mm. in elementary schools, in middle schools, in high schools. Mm. It's a reinforcement mechanism. By the time people come when out there is a budget cut, yes, when there's a budget cut that needs to be made, mm. the first thing out the door are the arts, music, and theater, and yes, yeah. <sighs> yes, it all goes. We, all we, goes, and that's we, we do need to address that at a systematic level. I mean, the the Aga Khan Music Award uh, addresses this on a systematic level. Um, the Aga Khan also, Award for but, Architecture uh, addresses this on a systematic level. I, th yes, I think. But, I think there are cultural institutions that are trying to modify this idea of culture being a frivolity, um, you know, but, but it, it's, it's, it's not enough. But here we go back to the, to, in a beautifully circuitous way in our, circuitous way in our conversation, and that is, hmm. ars longa vita brevis, these great mass, what I call the masterpieces of humanity, let's say in music, for example, hmm. The Beethoven Symphony, the Bach St. Matthew Passion, or the mm -hmm. Art of the Few, mm -hmm. or the Brahms First Symphony, or a Renaissance Motet, mm -hmm. uh, a choral piece of Palestrina. Mm -hmm. After all these politicians and all these other people who feel that art is not necessary or it's trivial, they all die. And, and yet this these great this masterpieces of them. music are being will be heard. A hundred, two, three, four, five hundred years from now, that is, the earth still survives. And that gives us great faith. Right. And we will always be in line to look at the Mona Lisa, at the Louvre. But incidentally, I have to tell you, if, if anyone ever goes to the Louvre, I don't know if it's open now again. It was closed when I was living in Paris this past year. They've uploaded the whole thing online. They have a complete... Well, let me just tell you, some of the most glory... I mean, the, the Mona Lisa is a glorious painting mm. to see. Not very big. A lot of people are surprised that they've ever mm. seen it for the first time. Mm. But the paintings on the way mm. to the room where the Mona Lisa is, mm. it has its own space. Mm. But, it, but stop and see all the paintings that are on the way because some of the real glories mm. of humanity are hanging on the walls before you even get to the Mona Lisa. Well, you know, it's funny. Beyonce actually shot one of her music videos in the Louvre. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She shot the entire music video in the Louvre. And, and, that doesn't uh, surprise me, actually. By the way, I want to tell you, there's a video, I think it's on YouTube, hmm. where somebody has taken a Beyonce video and they've put, they've taken out the sound, the original soundtrack, which of course is, is one of her songs, and they put in the Ride of Spring, the Sacre du Printemps of Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. And, and what they've done with the video, they've edited so that it goes exactly with the music. Right. Oh, you have to see it. You have to see it. Talk about interdisciplinary. Yeah. And it works beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's intercultural. And intercultural. But it, it looks as if it was choreographed to mm. this music. Mm. Brilliant. The, the concept alone is brilliant. Whoever came up with that is. Mm. I, I, I give great applause to that person. Yeah. All righty, go eat. Yes. Bon appetit. Well, I want to conclude now. You, as, you, Julia Child, you, as Julia Child used to say at the end of every, every one of her programs called The French Chef, bon appetit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to, I was going to summate everything that we discussed by saying, you know, uh, we are the narratives we tell ourselves and the, and the narratives we are told. And yes. That, and, and so if you're the story that you tell yourself, uh, then, you know, music, music well, is... Well, I think, it's interesting. I think I'm a collection of the stories that, of everybody, of everybody who, um, of all the people I've known. Sure. Uh, and, they, and many of them who are actually historic people have told me their stories. Mm -hmm. I've, people have been telling me I should really write a book because mm -hmm. I've known many historic people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what would you call your autobiography? Well, it wouldn't be my autobiography. It's a collection of the, of the people I've known, mm. in a sense. I don't know, you know, gosh, that's a very no, but But it's question. your life story. It's your life. It's, it's an autobiography of other people's biographies. Well, for example, uh, Peter but, Sadek, who is the stage director with whom I worked for many years, mm. 
at the Berliner Ensemble. He brought me there. He's one of the great stage directors of his time in the world. And, um, and I worked with him before that as well, before we were together at the Berliner Ensemble. But he wrote an autobiography and he called it My Way. Mm -hmm. He wrote it in German, even though he was British, but he wrote it in German because he mm -hmm. lived here for so many years, mm -hmm. most of his life. And, um, but he used the English title of the song, My Way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which kind of encapsulated a couple of things. Mm -hmm. First of all, he was very international. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born in Berlin in the mm -hmm. 30s. His family was Jewish. They read the handwriting on the wall, literally, and they immigrated to London. Mm -hmm. Peter was a little boy of five or six mm -hmm. years old, so he grew up there. And then he came back to Germany in the late 50s and revolutionized theater. Mm -hmm. And he, he never paid attention to what critics said. He felt that he had a very specific style and message that he wanted to convey, whether he was directing Shakespeare or Chekhov or Ibsen or Pinter. Mm -hmm. And he did. Mm -hmm. So he kind of did things his way. And yeah, it was his. It was his. Highway. It was his Weltanschauung. Yes, but also, uh, my way. In other words, I think it'd be interpreted as my path. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that aspect of it as well. Yes, which is very so, Sufi. Well, so not just Sufi. It's 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 other things. It's, yeah, well, it's all spirituality in a sense. The path. Yeah. The path, the path is a very spiritual idea. Yes, of course. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the mm -hmm. prophets talk about the path which you might take. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus talks about the path to heaven or the path to hell. Mm -hmm. In so many, he talks about it in many different ways, often through parallels, mm -hmm. parables. Mm -hmm. An uh, allegory, so, a metaphor. Yes. So, um, and in truth. Yes. So we all have our paths and we're all confronted by that fork in the road. Mm. Mm. Decide which way you choose. Yes, the forked tongue of the devil. Pray and hope and yeah. take the right path. Yes. And not whatever do anything sacrilegious. Is, whatever, whatever, whatever the path it is, mm. it should be a path of love and forgiveness and mm. giving mm. and sharing things that enhance uh the people with whom we come in contact yes compassion for fellow for your fellow man absolutely absolutely and from there you can be a great artist because you have empathy which is the thing we talked about at the yes. beginning of this and, yes and it's the thing that survives ours longer vita bravis we are all actors on this stage hmm. and at, at some point we leave the earth and the question is we what exit stage to left what do you want to leave behind? For us musicians, fortunately, because of, of mass media, we can have our videos online and so people can see our work long after we go. Or if you're a composer, people might, somebody might discover your works long after you're gone. You might not have been performed at all while you were alive, hmm. but all of a sudden somebody comes across your music. Your like Mendelssohn, like Mendelssohn and Bach. You know, a lot of people don't realize that, that after Bach died, so did his music. He mm. wasn't performed mm. until the, later in the 19th century uh, by Felix Mendelssohn, who, Felix Mendelssohn, who gave an organ recital of Bach's music and then conducted a concert of his music and people couldn't believe it. By the way, Mendelssohn is buried just a few blocks away from my house. I visit his grave once in a while. When I, when I first learned the Italian symphony years and years ago, I was conducted somewhere. I remember taking the score, mm. it was a summer's day, mm. late summer, early fall, late summer, and I took the score and I went to Mendelssohn's grave. His sister Fanny, who is also a composer, mm. is buried next to him, and then mm. his brother and his brother's kids are buried there as well. Mm. And mm. Uh, so I took the score and I kind of spent a few hours studying it there and enjoying the serenity of the cemetery. Fry, fry the romantic. Oh, it sounds rather Byron-esque, doesn't it, in a way? But I, I, I uh, it sounds like a, you know some painting of of, of Caspar David Friedrich. But uh, um, it was a lovely afternoon and romantic in a way, in the in this in the historical romantic sense, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. communing with one of the great musicians in history. Yes. Yes, I, I like to tell people 
Let us now commune with the ineffable. It's a great way of putting it as well. Thank anyway, you, Alex. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, let's, do part, let's do part two soon. We'll do part three, part four, part five. I think this is going to be multi-chapter. Well, this was a great conversation, and I really enjoyed this. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you. And uh, you guide the interview very, very well. You know who the greatest interview that I ever encountered was? The greatest interviewer? Who Please tell me. Studs Terkel, T-E-R-K-E-L. Hmm. Pulitzer Prize winning author in the United States. Hmm. But he just seemed to know something about everything. That's what, that's, you, could, you could mention any reference and hmm. he knew something about it. Hmm. Actually, he seemed to know a lot about it. That's what amazed me. You're kind of like that yourself, especially your tender young age. What are you, 22? 23, just turned 23. Oh, you old man. You're 23, <laughs> but you're an old man in a young guy's body. You know, I feel, I, I feel that way all my life, that I'm an old soul. Mm. 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 I think so. Do you, do you believe in uh, former lives? Absolutely. I do believe in reincarnation. I, well, this well, is definitely not my first rodeo. Well, I do believe in an afterlife. I do believe we go to heaven. I had a vision of it once, but that's another story. I mean, it was just incredible. It was so real. It was in a dream. Yeah. So unbelievably real. Yeah. Yeah, now, now, just write, now just write an organ symphony about it. Well, the, the, thing, the, th well, the thing is, uh, I do believe that we, that we go to heaven. I do believe that we have a talk with God and he, go and he goes through our life and he says, you know, here would be moments that I was proud of you. Here are the moments that I wasn't proud of you, mm. but basically you're a good person and, and, uh, and a good soul. <laughs> I, and, I don't, I, I don't want to think about Hitler and Stalin's conversation because that, that, that would be painful. Just, just, to... I, yeah, I, and I don't think they stayed up in heaven. Yeah. I think they were sent to another, yeah. they received their judgment and they were gone. But the thing is, uh, I, I, and I think that we are in paradise and we do live in peace mm -hmm. and it is for eternity. But I sometimes wonder in some cases, not every case, I think maybe in some cases you stay in heaven and you are with the other great souls. I mean, can you imagine having a piano lesson with Beethoven or Mozart? I mean, I do think, I think of heaven as a very peaceful place, but I also think it's an active place. I think there's great music making up there mm -hmm. and, uh, and conversation and so forth. Hmm. But you so are bay. at peace. So bay, as the Sufis would say, the mystical conversation. Uh, really? Yes, What's they the say that so bay. They say there's three ways of being with the mystery. The lowest level is prayer, then there's meditation, and then there's so bay, which is mystical dialogue, like the way Shams and Rumi would have spoken. But, you know, I mean, the mystery of God. Uh, he, he, I don't like it when people talk about the would talk about God as if he's somebody they have in their hip pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I'm baptized Greek Orthodox. And even though I've been also practicing Episcopalian or Anglican, I should say, mm -hmm. most of my life, I still am Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And to me, one of the great things about the Orthodox Church, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm both. I'm Greek Orthodox. And I'm also Anglican. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when I'm in Greece, for example, in the evenings on Spetsis Island, where I also live, um, I go to uh, the Church of St. Anthony, which is actually, a, it's like a small chapel in a way, but it's the Church of St. Anthony. And uh, it's in the commercial area down by the seashore, by the harbor. And I, and I go in and I say evening prayers. And, and Sometimes I walk along the seashore, which is just a few blocks away from where I live. And in the evening, I feel so connected with God. I, there's something very spiritual about it for me. Mm. And, and I realize, of course, the beauty of God in my life. I realize, but also the mystery that... Yeah, if anybody tells you that they know God or God's mind, they're deluding themselves. I think God knows us. Yes, but not the other way around. No, we know we know that God is love. We know the things that are written in the in mm -hmm. the prophets, mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, in what Moses, in the words of Moses. We know what Jesus mm -hmm. says as his son, as the Messiah. 
Well, that's why I say let let us now commune with the ineffable because that's well, what that's what that's what we can do. We can commune with that yes. unspeakable mystery, and and therefore yes. through experiencing it, we have a, a sense of what it is. Yes, and I think I think for example, no matter what your religion is. Mm the messages of peace and of love and treating each other the golden rule love your neighbors as yourself but that's a humanism but but it comes from spiritual texts yeah yeah it was it wasn't a philosophy that uh, i don't think it ever was a, um, a secular philosophy because it all came from very spiritual texts ancient spiritual texts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, for example, in uh, the gospel, according to St. Matthew, I think chapter 21 or 22 or 23, the Pharisees ask Jesus, what are, what's the most important commandment? And he said, well, there are actually two. And he said, the first one is love the Lord God with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your heart. And the second is love your neighbors as, as yourself. And the second is linked to the first, you see. But anyway, yes, telling because, you about, because about, the face about, of I, the face of God is in everything. But I, well, I was telling you yes, but I was telling you about the the, uh, the 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 spiritual side of my own life in a sense. Uh, I when we were talking about well, what they call reincarnation, having a second. I'm not talking about you come back as a spider or a snake or something like that, but you come back as another person. I often wonder. You, we all have had, I think. I don't know if all, everybody's had, but certainly I think you had, and I've had, we've had feelings of deja vu. Mm -hmm. uh, where, oh, yes. oh, I have been here before. Mm -hmm. My own father said once that he was uh, walking through a field with a friend of his, and he was very disturbed. He said, I've been here before. Mm -hmm. And the, the friend said, what are you talking about? He said, I just feel like I've been here before, and there's all this blood and violence. And, and he said to my father, you know, this was a Civil War battlefield. He said, "No, I didn't. I didn't know that." He mm -hmm. said, "Yes, mm -hmm. it, it was a. It wasn't a, a well-known battlefield, mm -hmm. and a brief war was fought there, but a lot of people died." Mm -hmm. So you see, my father had the sense that he'd been there before, mm -hmm. and so I sometimes wonder, maybe God, we get to heaven, and God says, "You know, hang out here for a while, but I'm not through. I need to send you back down. There's more work you need to do." Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, well, it's that's possible. the cycle. Well, look, the Hindus call that they call that the, the cycle of, of birth and death. And the, the, yeah. the, the ultimate goal is to attain moksha, which is the absolute liberation from that cycle. What's it called? Moksha. M-O-K-S-H. Moksha. Okay. And that means what exactly? The, abs the absolute liberation from the cycle of uh, life and death. Mm. From the cycle of incarnation. Incredible. You know, you run into somebody, you say, I feel like we've met before, hmm. even though you never have. Hmm. And the other person says, yes, I was just thinking the same thing. At that exact moment, hmm. two people have that profound thought and feeling. Hmm. Hmm. So it could be, yes, we did, a hundred years ago, hmm. or something like that. Hmm. On that note, we've met before, we shall meet again. Quite, quite. All right. I say, lovely. <laughs> oh, I have a beautiful evening, Afraz. Thank and you. And thanks for the great conversation. I avec, really enjoyed it. Avec plaisir. Et comme d'habitude. Pour, pour, pour moi aussi. <laughs> All right.